you guys. <laughs> My bad. Okay. Always remind me. I'm... All right. So uh, the first question was, and everyone should think about it because I'm going to make you. Well, all right. Let me go step back. What quality of character, when you think of a preacher, what qualities of character do you think they have? What do you associate with a preacher? What is it that makes a preacher any different from anybody else? So we'll just start with that. Um, Alexis, do you have an opinion about that? Um, yeah, I think a preacher or any person who has like authority in a church should be honest like willing to give I would say giving and empathetic I think that's how you say it okay, okay. what about you Colin um personally I think that a preacher should believe and do as they say to people um yeah that was the main thing that i kind of believe in don't be a hypocrite yeah mainly okay i just read about <coughs> excuse me billy graham's son franklin is suing somebody or getting sued for something yeah, he's getting sued by Liberty University because he made like 2.3 million bucks off of all this stuff. And he is, I was telling you the other day that he is a power hungry guy. Um, yeah, it's just getting worse. It's very sad, right? Because after 9-11, there was this big thing about we have to get back to God and all this. And turns out some of the main leaders of those movements have children that are completely corrupt. So I do think it's interesting to look at history um, and especially when it comes to piety, right? Who's, who's associated with religion because, because of the hypocrisy, Colin, right? It's easy to pull the wool over some people's eyes. Okay, Zane, what do you think? Uh, I would say they'd have to have a sense of leadership in a way, kind of like also not being hypocritical, but like leading by example, I would say. And also, I would say they need to be relatable to the people that they're over. Okay. Does that mean they listen? Right. Yeah. Listen. Just kind of show, kind of like what uh, Alexis said too, being, uh, you know, showing empathy for those people as well. Okay. Um, Alyssa, do you have any other thing to add? Um, I feel like also they need to be honest and like passionate about what they're preaching um, because like anything they say is not gonna have any weight if it's obvious that they don't strongly believe it. Okay, Michael? Uh, yeah, I agree with most of what's been said. Uh, I talked about uh, being honest, um, but also I think that like uh, with that honesty, like, uh, like it's pretty clear that like nobody is perfect and and whatever they're teaching uh from whatever uh text uh, i think it's important that like i feel like a lot of times like with preachers that i i've been around there's a there's a certain um kind of like a power gradient almost like uh not necessarily a feeling of that like i'm better than you um but i think it's important that like uh yeah that they don't that they don't uh, emulate that okay Ryan? Um, I would say, I just have a few words, passionate, forgiving, consistent, um, and they're due to accept their faith. You need to lean in. Okay. So I have compassionate, forgiving, consistent, and their deeds should match their faith. Okay. Okay. And then Tim. Uh, really, I just agree with everybody because, like, <laughs> Good. I mean, it's really about the honesty and stuff like that. It's kind of hard. What do you think? What do you think a good preacher should be, or or are you just saying the ones you? Well, I, uh, I mean, a good preacher should. I mean, sometimes honesty hurts, but it's good because coming from a preacher, it's like, well, 
he means all good. So, but, yeah. Well, why would you disagree? Disagree that what? You said you disagreed with other people? No, I, I agree. With other oh, people. okay, okay. All right. Um, well, what, what about um, being self-righteous? Uh, here's some other questions. Do you think a good preacher quotes from the Bible and absolutely knows that he's right? Is a question, right? Or do you think a good preacher should be humble and say there's lots of different ways to interpret this? But this is how I think it should be interpreted, or this is how I think it relates to what goes on. Um, at this particular moment in history, it's very important for you to think about this, because the Supreme Court justices that we have are claimed to be religious, and in the name of being religious, they're changing the gun laws, the environmental laws, the um, abortion laws, all that sort of stuff. So I really do think this is a particularly controversial moment for who's proving who's the most pious or religious, right? Um, I hope you understand that. So one question I asked the students on the video to answer was, is something pious or holy because the gods love it or God loves it or does God love it because it's holy all right Colin were you one of the ones that had seen the video uh yes ma'am okay is it holy because it's loved by the gods or is it loved by the gods because it's holy um honestly holy loved by the gods loved by the gods holy okay you can hold hold it yeah i really don't right? know i mean i'm gonna try to convince you it makes a big big difference and if you can't figure out why it makes a big, big difference, you might want to just stay and hold for a while and then comment later. That's fine. Who else watched the video? There was one other person. Okay, Michael, what you got? Oh, good, Zane, good. Um, go ahead, Michael. Uh, I was gonna, I didn't watch the video, but this was one of like my reflection things that I talked about uh, for your questions. Um, but I said that I think uh, things are loved by the gods because it's holy, uh, especially in like the time period that we're discussing uh, within like the ancient Asian Greek gods. Um, and they, they talked about it in the dialogue as well, like uh, the like uh, what, what the gods like defining it the other way. I feel like uh, it, it changes because like if you look historically before the gods and you look at like the Titans, obviously what they were thinking was also different from like what the the Greek gods were thinking. You know, uh, obviously everyone thought of them as as gods, regardless. You know, in, in a broader sense of the term gods. But yeah. Well, so do you think holiness? And then the Titans would also have some idea of holiness, even though they have totally different gods. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Okay, so every culture has some idea of holiness but totally different religious texts. Right. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, who else? Zane, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I would kind of agree with that pretty much, along with, uh, you know, that uh, the gods love it because it is holy. You know, I just try to dig down and, like, try to, like, think of it in, like, a more deeper standing, and, like, that's just what I came up with. I mean, that's just what made the most sense because, I mean, if it's just because, like, the gods loved it, and, I mean, it's not necessarily – anything special or you know it's nothing good or anything like that then it wouldn't be you know i wouldn't consider that holy but yeah okay good very good if that makes sense i know it's kind of i was kind of you know rambling well, stuff, it, but. it 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 makes sense to me so every culture has some idea of what holiness is or piety but they all have different ideas of the gods and what the gods love is that fair okay um, Alexis, do you want to make any comments? 
It's funny how every time you call my name, I immediately hit myself with something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I'm sorry. Um, so I honestly think that because the God said so, they think it's holy. And it's because it's normal everyday things that people really don't think about and really consider, like would think twice about. But because a higher being, in a sense, was like, this is the right thing to do and you should cast out all those other thoughts that you have, it's saying that we have those thoughts and those thoughts are like accessible for us and it's something we consider, but we shouldn't consider because it's not considered righteous. Okay. All right, I'll leave that one hanging. If anybody else wants to make a comment, really, I wanted, to, good, Michael, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say I kind of disagree with that, or more so the idea that um, something is pious or holy because it's loved by the gods. Uh, like we talked about yesterday, like, uh, you know, Ares kind of loved uh, killing people via war. Um, and that, I don't, you know, think that we could call that uh, pious or holy. Um, or you can look at like the uh, amount of extramarital children that they all had and kind of just like, uh, you know, le left in the Greek society. Um, I feel like uh, if, you, if you look at it via like their actions, and again, I know that we're talking about like Greek gods and uh, that kind of differentiates between other like religions that we'll cover. Sorry. Um, but yeah. Well, in, our, in the Judeo-Christian, the Old Testament God is very different than the way Jesus describes God, right? Right. Right. I mean, the Old Testament, I will take vengeance and I will punish you for seven generations. And Oh, my God. You can quote from a pretty vengeful God. And, you know, that's not what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He even quotes from the Old Testament and says, that's wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you something different. So um, it's not just the Greek gods. Uh, Alyssa, do you have a comment? Um, what Michael said makes sense to me, but like I do see both sides of the argument. I kind of more so believe um, that it, something's holy because the gods love it. Um, like just from like my like how I view it, it's like they made it holy. It wasn't holy prior to them. So that's why I think that, but both sides make perfect sense to me, honestly. Okay, uh, Ryan. Um, are we asking like our opinion or what is usually like? The you have to lean in. <laughs> okay, are we asking what we think it is or what it usually tends to be? well both you can oh, say both okay. so for me personally i feel like humans we are born with something within us unless you're mentally incapable like you have you know special needs or something like you are mentally uh given something spiritually too that like you know right from wrong like you see kids when they see other babies crying like they're in distress as well so i feel like humans have like innate um like like connection with other people so like I feel like we know right from wrong uh other things like maybe like you know when you get older things maybe like you might pick up on other things but I feel like things where it's like killing like I feel like we are born with that and so like I feel like that's holy not killing but the opposite of killing so empathy I like, <laughs> empathy yeah so I feel like um like we as humans like we already have that and then um, you know, the gods or God or the spiritual text or whatever kind of puts it into a higher thinking or at least into like scripture or like a uh, written form. And so like people just uh, relate to it. But I feel like all humans already have like know what is right from wrong or empathy. So I feel like that's kind of where I said it. Okay, good. Um, Tim. I'm gonna kind of piggyback off what Ryan said because like, I kind of was confused on if you were asking like does it make it that way or what it does but how I see it is it doesn't 
doesn't necessarily mean that certain way if the gods say it like like I like I'm paid off of Lexi. She kind of said that like, well, it's like everyday things. So I mean it's kind of hard to explain because I had two thoughts at once. That's kind of that's why I'm kind of struggling to say it right now, but you can say both of them. yeah, it's kind of like yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, that kind of just made me think of like the idea of do you have to have religion to be a good person? Like, I feel like I choose to read the Bible and it brings out my faith and makes me try to be a better person. But do I think people can live a beautiful, productive life that helps society and other people and dedicate and you know make something bigger than themselves? Yeah, I think you can do that without without religion, but I feel like religion or I guess believing in gods, I don't have it doesn't have to be religion, but like being spiritual can push you to, you know, help certain people. Maybe they need that. Maybe they need text to read to be a better person or to have more um conviction in what they're believing. But yeah, I think people can be good people without having to associate. Okay. Uh Alexis. When I said I feel like what I said kind of was out of context is my thoughts are jumbled when I said that um, things are like holy because God said so because there are everyone has morals that we were taught as a child like we're taught like no don't touch that that's hot and our parents will and we won't touch it anymore because it's hot so things like that like no you shouldn't um, but then there's things like people know not to steal but um people will still do so even though we were told not to. Right. I, I think it in a sense is we are taught the straight, we are taught what's right from wrong, but some people need something more to be like, well, you should love thy, your neighbor, even though they might be the most strugglesome person in the world and they might not have the same beliefs as you, you should still love them. Okay, would you say some people need external motivation? Mm -hmm. like such as religions or anti-religions in some case because there are those some nowadays well what about when the bible was used to justify racism and sexism and people honestly in their conscience um, thought it was wrong to free your slaves or it was wrong to let your wife go to college it's because bibles these days are or like some texts are kind of taken out of text in my my viewpoint that some that some people take a like a right like a scripture or whatever and they take it out of context like if we look at the taliban they're they're using their the quran in a different way it's meant to be said because they're using their own like how their own how they don't like justify it and how they read it as right and wrong it's it's the same text two different people are reading it but one person's taking advantage of it like the very simple like not simplified words very like words like being taken either or and using it for the advantage um i know growing up that my mom used to tell me the story of a girl um and it was kind of a god it was a god and her child and she took a piece of clay it was white clay and she made a beautiful daughter but then she took a piece of mud and made another person and her the daughter said she didn't like the mud one because it was dark and ugly and she didn't like it because it wasn't refined like clay and her mom sat her down and told her that she should love both both things equally because they have their own quality like they have their own ways of being beautiful that if you compare the two they're definitely going to be different but they're both equally and beautiful in their own way so i think it i think i usually think of that when i think of how people judge the, the like the bible and the quran all that that it's how the person reads it but what do you it, think what do you think about euthyphro he quoted, in order to justify taking his dad to court for murder, um, that's where on the video I explained to you that story, mm -hmm. that how many, I mean, if you watch the video, you would know. So Colin, you may make a comment. Do you think he quoted out of context? 
Um, I mean, everything can be brought out of context in someone else's eyes, uh, except for the person who said it and meant it. So I think in the way, yes. Okay, well, sometimes people will quote, you know, people change their minds too. And they, they, the same quote means something different. And also sometimes they even forget that they changed their mind. Okay, I'm old enough. So I've seen this, right? Uh, I, I mean, I used to read a, a certain editorial writer for the New York Times and it drives me nuts because a year later he would completely reverse what he'd said earlier. And he gets so much respect. It just really annoys me. You should know what you think. And you can change your mind, but you can't just keep, you know, just saying whatever you feel. Anyway, so um, let me tell you the story then and what Euthyphro, what quote from the holy books he's using to justify what he does. And then I want you guys to tell me, do you think Euthyphro is right? Um, all right, so the story is that originally it's a creation story. There was just Earth, there was just Earth, Gaia, and she gave birth to sky, Uranus. And then they started having offspring. Uh, <coughs> well, there were, the Earth started having earthquakes and uh, mountains were formed and forests and all this stuff. And then they had some children and they had some monsters who had five heads and five arms and, okay. And Uranus was both embarrassed by them and afraid of them. So what happens? Uh, so he buried them in the earth, Gaia. Is that an abuse of parental authority, right? Here's the, here's the metaphor, right? Well, if a guy, if a father gets his ego caught up in his children and he wants them to be a chip off the old block, right? Is that healthy? Well, what happens if your kid is not as good looking as you or not as smart as you, not as athletic as you? Is that should the father be embarrassed by the child for something they can't control? I guess that's a rhetorical question, right? Of course not. What about if he's cuter than the father and he's smarter than the father and he's more athletic than the father? Then what do these kind of guys do? They compete with them, right? Is that good? Is that healthy? No, of course not. So, I mean, the, the punchline is let your kids be who they are. Like, don't try to control who they are. You can't anyway. Anyway, so Gaia, you can imagine, is really mad <laughs> because if a father, and it doesn't have to be a father, but let's just go with this. If he does start damaging his children psychologically, she's going to embrace them, right? She wants to protect them. So they get buried in Gaia, which also is not healthy because if you're just a mommy's boy and you can't go out in the world, that, that doesn't work. So then she got all of her parent, our kids together and she had this sickle. She says, okay, somebody's got to cut off his genitals. This is great. <laughs> you get sex ed, you know, from Dr. Beck. Okay, you cut off his genitals, why? Because Eros is your passion. All of those deities are about passion, a passion for justice, a passion for truth. So, so one of the children named Kronos, which means time, he raised his hand. He said, okay, mom, I'll do it. And so he cut off his genitals and threw them in the sea. Well, what's happening when Gaia, originally, it was just a chunk. The earth was a, a chunk of, of dirt, like a rock. And then Uranus was born. And then you have the earthquakes and the volcanoes. 
Well, now you have a natural history. Now you have a before and after. Things are changing. So Kronos takes over, right? Now time is governing what's going on in the world. Do you understand that? The metaphorical interpretation. Does that make sense? Um, but then uh, Euthyphro is using it to justify. He says, well, I'm not cutting off my father's genitals. I'm just taking him to court for murder, right? Um, so then Socrates says, do you really believe those stories when the gods are doing all that awful stuff? Because I think the gods are good. And so I don't think they do that stuff. And uh, <laughs> Euthyphro says, well, of course. It's true. And, you know, I could quote you a million other things, too. And Socrates says, well, I guess, you know, hold off. Um, but you must know what piety is. If you know that this is what the gods want, I really want to know from you what is piety. Because Socrates is getting accused of being impious and not believing in the city's gods. Well, right away there, you know why he's getting accused because he says i don't believe that stuff i because i think the gods are good and on the other hand you can completely read it as poetry metaphorically and it's got some really important messages for people psychologically what not to do anyway so um so here's their their meeting and euthyphro is the is the fundamentalist, right? Quotes literally. And he's taking his court father to court for murder and his family is appalled. Socrates, on the other hand, is the one who reads the stuff metaphorically, not literally. And he's getting taken to court for not believing in the city's gods. And so the question is, what is piety, right? Euthyphro has a reputation for being pious but now you have this minister who's doing stuff that the parents, his family thinks part of piety is to respect your elders. <laughs> okay, so Euthyphro thinks that Athens is declining and he's gonna lay, the, lay down the law and he's gonna represent that we have to get back to God and we have to honor God and I'm gonna do it publicly by doing this and it will help Athens recover. And um, Meletus is accusing Socrates uh, because he doesn't read the stuff literally. He's the cause of why Athens declined. And so um, he's getting sent to court and he's gonna get killed. So then the question is, what is piety? So I want to impress on you, people really disagree on what is pious and it's driving world history at this moment. It's certainly driving American history. Um, so what, I'm gonna to go to the, um, here's the definitions, right? And I, I'll stop and ask you, oh, oh, let me just do this, I'm sorry. Why doesn't everybody start with one thing that they wanted to bring and talk about in class? So Colin, was there something you wanted to talk about? Um, I see. I know a little bit about. Isn't Kronos the guy who ate all the other gods? He actually he was afraid his kids were going to do the same thing to him, so he devoured them. Okay. Yes. And that's um, a metaphor. Like time eats us all, right? I'm getting eaten up by time and I'm becoming more aware of that. But anyway, go ahead. So Kronos knowing and the person who is stepping up to combat his father, why would he do the same act again? The very <laughs> act that made him step up and become the king of the gods at that time. Yeah. Is that what does that happen in families? It can. People get abused and they vow they're not going to do it and they end up doing the very thing. 
that's the way your mind plays tricks on you. And that's why they have these stories so that when, so that you can see it, right? You can um, remember that story and think, oh my God, I'm doing the same thing. The other thing is that it's a critique of patriarchy. When men control things, they abuse their power and the women get really PO'd. <laughs> Does that make sense, Colin? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Michael. Um, let's see. So discussion, questions, reflections. Okay. So one of the things I talked about uh, was whenever, um, how do you say the guy's name that starts with an E? Euthyphro? Euthyphro? Just Euthyphro. say the E guy. No, no, no. I got it. Euthyphro. Euthyphro. I couldn't remember. Uh, so whenever uh, he told him about his dad and Socrates immediately uh, assumed that he was his dad had murdered someone like within the family. And I think that that kind of showed the uh, kind of showed like the uh, the climate within all probably upper class uh, individuals is that if you were to be prosecuting someone within your family, it's because they had probably done something um, to someone within your family. Um, so that was one of my points. I talked about your question about piety versus impiety as well. Um, not piety versus impiety, but uh, whether the gods believe it or, you know, da, da, da. Anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, and then my third, my third point was pretty, pretty like a, I guess it was like a pretty blanket uh, reflection, but just the fact that like Socrates was basically prosecuted for questioning things that were like blindly accepted um so let's see i talked about how it seemed like socrates was really more of a beacon of free thought uh not one to quarrel with others for no reason but to figure figure out exactly what that reason is yeah i mean what happens when there's one and only one interpretation of the religious books is that democracy <laughs> okay uh ryan Um, so one thing that I put down was this, we're talking about piety, like just what do people consider holy? What do people consider holy? Like the whole idea of piety and stuff like that, like how do we come to a conclusion? How do we come, come to a conclusion about what is really acceptable? Like earlier I talked about us being born with certain morals, but, um, when people differ on certain um, polarized ideas, are they straying from what they truly believe? Are they just trying to be different from the crowd? Like, I don't know, whatever it may be. It gets corrupted, right? So our natural empathy gets corrupted. Um, yeah, I raised my kids to have primarily empathy and then the world will do what it does. <laughs> Um, but at least they'll know, you know, that that's the foundation. Um, anything else? Um, sorry, I just wanted to add something. I, I was watching um, God's Not Dead today, and I didn't finish the movie. But it's funny that you say that, because one of the quotes that stuck out to me was the guy said, um, grace first, then justice. Because if we, if we don't have grace, then we're just all yelling. And so I really just love that quote because as I said before, I want to go into law. And so I love how that brings me back, like to humanize, I guess, every case that I'm going to go into and realize that, you know, um, that everybody's a human. It's hard to like look at a bunch of papers, look at a bunch of cases and be like, oh, next one, next one, next one. And I think if we lead with grace, then everything else will follow suit. So yeah, that just reminds me of that. Yeah, so um, that your, well, I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, your heart is in the right place, and then you can kick in your head, right? Um, okay, Tim, any, what were, you can, you don't have to do all three of your points, but at least. Um, one of my points were, like, relating to Kronos, well, about how the metaphor time eats all of time eats us all 
I feel like that's like very relatable to like um when I read it and I mean not read it, watched the videos and stuff, I was like, well, going by how people look, like the time you just all like, especially like like money, after a while you're gonna run out looks, you're gonna run out like skill, like agility, like I just feel like if you read if you read the books and stuff about Kronos probably just look past it, but then you can see it in real reality. It's like, well, it's kind of true. So it kind of makes you open up more about that type of stuff. Yeah, and actually I think um, in college, you should try to think about what is it you really, really want to do because 50 years from now, but as I said with Ryan, you don't, you know, you can balance all that out at various times in your life. Um, Alexis. Um, so basically, I just wrote mine off of, I'm so bad with Greek names, so I'm just going to state it, and I'm going to hope you catch on, but the guy that um, um, sent his dad to jail. <laughs> hey, you could just say the E guy. The E guy. So um, I wrote that, um, if I look at that from my person, like standing in my mother had done that or my father had done that I would do I would submit the evidence and like show like prove that it happened but I don't think I personally would take my mom to court for it like well, yeah what, what, I, if, what about if you're in Texas and you suspect that your daughter got an abortion are you gonna get 10,000 bucks are you gonna take her to court no well, why um, do we have a law like that then? Um, I, I personally wouldn't do that because there are, I, but I also wouldn't take my mom to court for that, like related killing either. I think that everyone has underlying reasons for everything. And the way you look at it is just one angle of it. Like that's just one side of the cube of the whole equation. Yeah, but you're going to claim that this is what God wants. I know this is what God wants. So I just happened to make 10,000, but it's very important that my daughter is arrested because that's what God wants. She killed innocent life. Do you think that's true, Alexis? Do you mm -hmm. think, I mean, Socrates would say, are you sure, <laughs> right? Do you see what I mean? How come you're so sure? Does that make sense, Alexis? It does. I just personally, I couldn't do it like I could if it was something that was so that God wanted and that's what we're pushing we shouldn't have to be like oh if you do it you'll get ten thousand dollars because if it's the will of God I shouldn't make a profit from it I'm just helping God's will be performed does that cultivate empathy <laughs> when a parent it does not cultivate empathy at all because God has always said that one is easily forgiven that anyone who has done wrong. Can okay, so here we are, right? I mean, you can understand there's going to be Bible quotes thrown all over the place when this starts actually sinking in. Um, Alyssa, I'll have to move on, Ryan, but keep keep it in mind. Real quick, I it's time for me to go, so I have oh, to go. Okay, well, have a good time. You with too. Your, she's going to her grandma's birthday party. Fine with me. <laughs> I'm a grandma. I would want my grandkids to quit class. <laughs> bye bye. Have a lovely day. Okay, Alyssa. Um, I was kind of, I, me and Alexis were kind of thinking of the same things, like the if it is the will of God, then I shouldn't be making a profit from it. So if, um, like um, like we shouldn't be having to seek out a reason to follow along with God it should just come natural I feel like and that's what I felt like uh Socrates was saying and then like what Michael said um how um sorry I just lost my train of thought <laughs> um you come back to me in a minute sure Zane yeah uh sorry if my camera's not working I've been trying to fix it a little bit but uh First off, I want to start with, like, I kind of, or I do agree with, like, if it is, like, you know, the will of God, I don't think it should, uh, you know, obviously, I don't think they should be pushing a reward in that case scenario. 
Uh, so I do agree with them when I go to that point. But uh, what I was wanting to bring up is like kind of going along with that, with like taking your loved ones to trial and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I think it, I think it's kind of in- interesting when you think about it, like especially in today's age. I'm not talking about like abortion, but just like other things. Like if something like, let's say your child is done, uh, that you know is going to hurt others. Like where's like the line that you draw? to where, you know, you protect your family and where you got to protect, you know, society and other people. And I was, like, kind of thinking about that line. I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, what if you, what if you know your parents are drug addicts? Mm -hmm. Do you report them? Right, yeah, I mean, I I just think it's, like, like, it's a tough scenario, like, it's a tough situation for anybody that's going to be put in that position, like, where, you know, you know, like probably the right thing to do in that case scenario to protect, you know, everybody else and even, you know, your loved one uh, to, you know, to go report them would be the best thing. But you also don't want them to be punished and like have to go through all that. So I just think that's that was an interesting point. OK. Um, all right. Ryan, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, I was just going to say that the Bible does emphasis. I like, yes have to uphold God's standard but also it does emphasize the idea that we're not the final judge and so like it's not our place to bring judgment upon others because how we judge others is how God will judge us so I just wanted to emphasize that and then the idea about bringing your a loved one to court for me I just grew up in a very like very family like you right it's like right or that you know for your family and so I think that's a, a tough situation. And I guess like when it comes to maybe the well-being of, well-being of a well-being for another person, like for example, you see the shootings that happens and you know, all of those things. If you know somebody is mentally not there and they have a gun and stuff like that, I think that's where if they are going to kill somebody else and you know that or shoot out of school innocent people, then you should, um, you know, that's, that's what crosses the line. But I think maybe there should be some intervention between you know, I mean, that's like a severe case, but if there could be some intervention without trying to bring judgment upon that person, I think that would be the best route for me personally. Yeah, I, I was surprised that nobody said that preachers should not be judgmental, right? Um, I, you know, should they be or shouldn't they be? And are they or aren't they? Um, so keep that in mind. And also, they should be humble, right? They should be intellectually honest, right? I don't know for sure, but this is how I interpret it. Like, does anybody know absolutely what God wants? There's like 300 books in the Bible and they all disagree with each other. So um, I think that's kind of a hint that you're supposed to be a little humble about your interpretations. But that's what Socrates thought. So yeah, I'm going to get the hemlock. Anyway, so piety is doing what I'm doing. He's absolutely certain that he's right. So what do you think of Euthyphro, right? Do you think he's a pious man or do you think he's... Then Socrates, I said, he, Socrates couldn't figure it out. He, he didn't know if Euthyphro was arrogant or if he just really thinks in black and white ways. So I've had students, you know, and they they like Euthyphro and they agree with them. And I have students that really don't like Euthyphro and he's really arrogant and full of himself. So Plato, Plato wrote these dialogues for people to talk about because nothing is clear cut because that's how life is. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And so Euthyphro thinks he's right. And then Socrates, well, what is piety? And it's what's dear to the gods. Well, the trouble is the gods disagree. And the trouble is in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's two creation stories. And, uh, you know, the same writer that wrote wrote, um, the, the wisdom, Proverbs, also wrote Ecclesiastes. In Proverbs, thing makes sense. In Ecclesiastes, it's all is vanity. It's like he's having his midlife crisis. So, you know, there's a lot of disagreement um, within the Bible, if you do it literally. And then there's definitely people interpreting 
uh, various parts of the Bible. Um, so what all the gods love is pious. Well, Socrates says, well, in, your, in this particular case, human beings really disagree. So don't you think the gods probably disagree? And Euthyphro says, no, no, I could explain it to you, but we don't have time. So is this, is, is Euthyphro arrogant or is he just a black and white thinker? Um, and then we, we discuss that question. Okay, piety is that part which it tends to. <coughs> and this is a question of, is, is, is it different to take uh, your own daughter to court for murder or to take, I don't know, your daughter's friend or somebody you don't know that you know got an abortion? Is that okay if you don't know them? Anyway, so the next thing, question, and I think this was one of the questions. Yeah, this was a question I asked you on the video. What kind of service do you give to the gods? When you go to church, when you pray, when you read the book, uh, the Bible, when you uh, maybe do volunteer work or you tithe, you know, whatever you're doing, which you think is reinforcing your relationship to God, what kind of service is that? Is it slave to a master, right? Are you like God's slave? And Socrates said, well, the slaves serve the master because the master needs them. And Euthyphro goes, no, no, <laughs> the gods don't need us. Well, what is it then? And then do we attend to the gods for the God's sake or for our sake, right? If we do it for our own sake, then what kind of service is analogous to doing pious acts? So for example, does the art of medicine attend to the doctors or to the doctors attend to the art of medicine? Does the art of shipbuilding attend to shipbuilders or do shipbuilders attend to the art of shipbuilding? And medicine produces health, shipbuilding produces ships. Well, what about the art of piety, right? Does the art of piety serve humans or do humans serve the art of piety? And what is the goal? What does the art of piety produce? All right, I'm going to ask all of you, if you go to church or if you do this or, the, you know, things that you consider strengthening your relation to God, if you don't, right? then why do you think, do you think uh, that it's, some people need it, that's fine. Do you think, well, people really get deluded about good and evil because they do this stuff, but they end up thinking God's will is whatever they want to think it is anyway. It doesn't really make any difference because they'll believe that God wants us to, you know, take, take, uh, our daughter to court for murder and take the 10,000 bucks, or God wants us to get rid of environmental protection laws, or God wants us to, you know, hate gays, not marry gays or whatever. Um, so anyway, what is it that the art of piety serves humans or do humans serve it? And what does it produce? Okay. And what are the similarities and differences between the goal of shipbuilding, medicine, and piety? Okay, you guys, uh, I'm gonna do a, a round. What do you think, Colin? I am so sorry, but you said a lot. In the, I know. Uh, I'm trying to find the document that you pulled it up on. What well, we the, can go ahead. What's the question? What's the main question that you'd like me to answer? Well, does the doctor serve the art of medicine or does the art of medicine serve the doctor to produce health? Same with the shipbuilder. So what about does the person serve the art of piety or does the art of piety serve the person? And what's the product? Pers like 
personally, going back to the doctor's thing, I think the medicine should serve like the doctor in that way. Like, I think that if the doctor has all the tools that they can get, that they should be able to do as they please. If it's for the betterment of the person that's in question. Okay, so if the doctor serves the art of medicine, then they're learning their skill, right? Yes. Right. If the art of medicine is serving the doctor, what else can the doctor do with that art? They have, my way of like seeing that and understanding it is that they have the whole idea of art of medicine down. So they can manipulate it to what they need to, like for cancer, they can manipulate it to solve the cancer or to end the cancer. Or but he's serving, the, he's serving the, the art, right? Yes. Okay. The other way around, can somebody decide I'm going to become a doctor to get rich? That, that's, my, that's my main goal. So the art of medicine is serving me. And okay, does that make sense, Colin? Yes. Okay. Whereas if I'm serving the art of medicine, I do what the patient needs and it, it's not about money and okay, it's not about status. Way. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so how does that apply to piety, <laughs> right? Does Granted, they, my, they should manipulate the literature not to hinder a person. They should manipulate it to make it seem better for a person. So instead of the olden days of God's wrath, God was a hateful person. Now it's God's a great person. God is amazing. So they change like using religion and things of that nature as like a source of fear to a source of hope. Okay. Okay. Kind of. That's that's a good point. That's a kind of standard way of understanding the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, okay, Michael. Um, okay, so I, let's see, I wrote down that without doctors, we would still have medicine, uh, but without medicine, I don't think that we would have, like, doctors. Uh, I'm not sure what, like, which uh, side that that goes with for what you were asking us. Um, I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, so, you know, there was herbal medicine, there was sort of natural medicine, and now we have this incredibly complicated skill, right? right. Um, well, if the art is serving the doctors, you can have, you can say our whole healthcare system is really driven by greed, not by a desire to keep people healthy, because you can tell they don't do anything with wellness, and they do all this stuff with they don't stop all the things that are making us sick, but they make a lot of money making us supposedly healthy or maintaining right. our health, right, Michael? Right, we don't, we don't focus on preventative medicine. And that would be an indication that the doctor is not serving the art, but the art is serving the medical profession. Right, right. right. Okay, and so with religion, is religion, you know, serving people or are people serving religion or are religious leaders also using it like a tool uh, for their own benefit, right? Yeah, so I feel like uh, when it's done incorrectly, um, religious leaders definitely use it as a tool. Um, but I think when it's done correctly, uh, it, it can be used as, as a service to service to people. Um, somebody brought it up earlier, but basically how religion can just be used as like a, a an anchor for like morality, uh, basically. Um, so, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would be willing to grant that Billy Graham and um, even Jerry Falwell had good intentions or something, right? Although, I Falwell got pretty self-righteous and arrogant toward the end. 
Um, but his kids definitely were hiding behind religion and doing all this crappy stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, Ryan, what about you? Um, I would say both, like equally, like um, you use the analogy of, or you use the example of like religion and how that serves people or does people serve religion. I think it's both. Like I interpret my relationship with God as a friend and as a father. So when I do good deeds, I don't just do it for the person I'm doing it for. Like I do it for a friend, aka God. So like in that way, I'm serving him. But then at the same time, I ask him to guide me. I ask him for things that I pray for. I ask him for clarity and to have compassion, things that I need help with. So I think it's both equally to give and take. Um, but yeah, and also, obviously, like I think that uh, people can weaponize religion and people can manipulate it to fit their own narrative. And I think that's the that's the harm in some types of religions because a lot of the times people find themselves going into religion because they're in a hard place like not i i think I, for me and my personal experience the majority of the people that i've seen turn to religion or god usually it's because they're stuck in a hard place in their life and they just don't know where to go and they have nowhere else and then they're like you know and they find that knowledge that they dig deep in themselves and then they find god um, so I think sometimes they take advantage of that. A lot of, uh, that's why I turned away from religion because I feel like um, a lot of the times it's used to um, catch people when they're really not able to, you know, like question things. Okay. Yeah, and there's plenty of quotes. God answers prayers. So if you ask to be rich and, you know, you don't get rich, then you either think, well, God doesn't answer prayers or you think, um, I mean, it really depends upon what you're asking, right? Seek and you shall find. I mean, it really depends on what you're seeking. But there is a prosperity gospel. You know, there are people who say you're rich because you're blessed by God, uh, which I, I mean, so what about the rest of us? You know, um, I think that's a corruption. Does that make sense, Ryan? Okay, Tim, what do you think the art of piety produces? Well, as for the question for the doctors, I definitely think the medicine makes the doctors because, I mean, the, it's good for doctors, but the main source is the medicine. Anybody can just go in there here this is good for you stuff like that but the doctors sometimes they could just prescribe you less just to maintain you instead of just heal you right there for a different pay so that's just what i personally think that then, that medicine then, gets corrupted by money sometimes yes okay and then um for the for like who serves who and with God and stuff and churches. I feel like we serve, I want to say, yeah, I feel like we serve them because we, when we go to church, it's like, it's like spiritual health if in, in a sense, because you go there, it's good to like cleanse and stuff like that and talk to God because obviously you can't see him, but everybody can personally feel him when you're in there and they're all praying and stuff like that so just like a it's like a spiritual wave or i don't know how to say it right but the trouble is the sermons vary so much right so you get put in this certain emotional place and then the preacher says very different things so that's, uh, that's why personally that's why for some people I know no matter what where they go, they try to keep their head screwed on the right path. And if the whoever's talking says something that's like out of not line, but like out of the way, they kind of like not ignore it, but like still stay on the path of what the right um words are, instead of just going in a like a way different um conversation. Okay. Um, Zane, 
What about you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a difficult question to think about, but I would kind of agree with what Tim said, especially when it came to like the medicine. I think the medicine does serve the doctor as well, but I think it also goes both ways. Um, it just really depends. I mean, and it, it's kind of like you said, like, you know, different preachers will say different things and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit complex. Okay. And Alyssa? Um, it all kind of made me think of how, like, it's not necessarily that um, God is serving us or we're serving God. Like, personally, my relationship has always been more like God is a teacher and we're students. And, like, like I don't have to follow what he says, but it will help me if I do. And, like, like um, I think Ryan said, turning to, like, the church when you're at a low point seeking guidance like going to office hours when I've sat there and neglected everything. Um, it just, it's like a, you have to have like a personal connection with your teacher or like God um, and finding the right fit for you. But it all just kind of makes you think of like teacher student, not necessarily like master slave and stuff like that. Okay. Um, all right, so we're back to Yusuf Fro. And he says, piety is learning how to please the gods by prayers and sacrifices. This is going to save families and the state. And um, doing what is unpleasing to God will ruin everything. Well, Socrates thought that his action was undermining the family and society. And he thought it was preserving the family. And then the next definition, piety is an art of doing business, right? Human beings honor, please the God, give money and time. And in exchange, uh, you get a stable family. Does that mean good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people? Well, what if something bad happens to you? Is that because God thinks you're a sinner? You know, um, you did something wrong and then God helps those who help themselves. If you're rich, that means you're blessed by God. Do we worship the gods in hope of a better life? Is it a cost benefit analysis? Are we just calculating our own self-interest, right? Um, and then what about mega churches? Is that really a sign of how pious people are? Or is that a way to network, get a better job? What about capital punishment? Um, we're gonna read the Sermon on the Mount. And um, Jesus very clearly says, you know, you don't take revenge. Um, and making abortion <coughs> illegal. So my friend's child died of SIDS. Does that mean my friend was wicked and getting punished? Um, people deny their children medical care in the name of God. Um, people engage in first strike military action. In the name of God, George W. administration had a policy of first strike. And he was claimed, you know, to be a real religious guy and to pray. He always said he prayed every day. Um, and he stood in front of the Hilton Hotel saying that. But he also happened, all his policies happened to help the rich get richer. So who is he praying to? Um, who is he really trying to please? Um, how about government programs that lift up the poor? Um, all right, so we have lots of controversies about piety. So let me go to some of these news articles. Um, this one was my friend who's, whose child died. And, um, you know, it wasn't, I don't think it was punishment. I don't think God was telling her you're evil because you go to a Unitarian church or anything. Um, and then you had this article about God is not a Democrat or Republican. There's different issues. So on abortion, for example, um, you know, there are churches that think abortion should be legal. And, and the, the ones who don't will think, well, those aren't real churches, that's corruption, I think. Um, some of them certainly do. Well, why would somebody think it should be legal? Well, because you'll have fewer abortions with an S because when 
you force people to have babies and they and there's more kids in poverty and um uh there's more women who if they get pregnant they will desperately try to get an abortion they will go underground if you don't teach teenagers sex education and give them contraceptions contraception they will go underground and then well they deserve it you know they're just going to hell and we're going to put that in our constitution that they deserve it and it should be illegal the other point is that a lot of politicians who basically have reputations for not being good actors are make get votes out of that so in general they're bad people they do all sorts of bad stuff but oh they're totally against abortion so abortion is used as a political tool too and there if you have humanism like i said um i do want to ask each of you to comment on some part of these articles, one of these articles. Um, this one is about uh, what happened after 9-11 because there was all this stuff about religion and God and we should use this as a, a, a motivation to uh, worry more about our oil consumption. We should encourage people to have, to volunteer for good causes. Um, and then he didn't do anything, right? We started torturing in the name of religion, okay? George W. Bush really united religion. He said he prays every day, and then he ends up torturing people. And uh, Mr. Dowd, right, he, he said he was kind of in love with George Bush, and all of a sudden, you know, he realizes this is not the guy I thought it was. And what about um what about political polarization is that what god wants um because religion is definitely a tool to polarize people so is that you know do you agree with that if you know if you believe in something hard enough it doesn't matter if it polarizes people because this is the right thing and we really ought to make laws that conform more with god's will okay so then this guy, Nicholas, shows about, there's a lot of religious bigotry. There's Franklin Graham. Um, here, I mean, here he is, you know, oh, the Muslims are so wicked. Turns out, you know, he's stealing money left and right. Um, doesn't surprise me. Um, okay, and then he says that Muslims are egalitarian. Well, not all of them are, but some of them are. And people convert because Muslims are more pious. They have the character traits, even though they have a different ideology. Um, then this one is um, the sacrifice. You know, we ought to use this as an opportunity to get less wasteful energy policies, to focus on uh, national service, to make real sacrifices, to try and create a middle class. Uh, but that's not what we did. We got even more polarized and less energy efficient. And we it tended, it got used to help the rich get richer. But underneath the surface, the rich got richer. But on the surface, it was, well, let's get back to God. Um, there wasn't any real sacrifice. And this is an interview with a guy from the US who's very um rapidly anti-Muslim. So um, let me just point out a couple other things that the Supreme Court is in favor of bringing church and state together more. So um, not only abortion, but also um, guns, right? The reason the Democrats, why did they think of it as a public safety issue, right? That if you can have evidence that if you have, that if you have background checks, and you have, you don't sell guns to felons and you don't sell mentally ill people shouldn't have guns. You know, the kind of recommendations. They justify it based on data and public safety, right? And public health. And you can do that in our constitution. Then there's the gay, right? Um, so again, if you unite reason and faith, there's plenty of churches that 
except uh, they ordain gays, they marry gays, because they unite reason and faith. Um, and there are seven quotes in the Bible, but the person, the book that those quotes exist in, that same priest also said, you can treat your slaves however you like. And so is it true that this one priest has complete authority even when other things that he said, uh, rabbi, sorry, rabbi, uh, when, when you wouldn't agree with other things he said. So you need to contextualize that. Then another major thing is to get rid of environmental protection laws. So now that there are fewer laws on air pollution, um, because that wasn't in the original constitution. And then the latest thing has been the football coach who wants to take a knee after a game to pray. Well, okay, what are the two sides? Well, when Colin Kaepernick took a knee to, to make people more aware of racism, that was really bad because, you know, it's being self-critical. I guess speaking as Socrates, like in a democratic society, you ought to applaud people when they're trying to get us to re-examine ourselves and our wickedness and our, our unexamined lives, right? On the other hand, the person who wants to take a knee for um, Christianity, for prayer, well, what about that? I mean, in both cases, there's what about peer pressure, right? And that's what the justices that dissented said that kids are going to get so much pressure and they're going to get judged. This is a very polarizing thing because some of the kids on sports teams are, are not religious at all. They come from Europe. Their secular humanism is the culture. A lot of my students are like that. And what if some of them are Jewish, of course, and they could be Muslim? I mean, so, um, so what do you think is, I want you to, I asked each of you to give an example of where people really disagree, oops, excuse me, on what's pious and what's not. So what about you, Colin? I know this is kind of like a weird one, but I kind of think of the Chick-fil-A. Um, so I'm not sure if they changed this, but to open a franchise of Chick-fil-A, you had to be um, blanking on it. So like involved within the church. Oh, okay. Yes, you had to be like really involved in one of your churches, then get like a very, very lucky pretty much to be able to open one branch of Chick fil A. Um, so then I knew, like, pe most of the time you'd have to start off at like kids and teenagers to get to the level that you would need to before you're like 30 and 35 to be able to open one because Chick fil A pays for everything and does everything. All you just got to do is run it pretty much. So I know people who like started doing that because they wanted to open a Chick-fil-A and be able to own one. So it's one of those weird things that they use religion to benefit themselves for personal gain for like money and things of that nature. Ulterior motives. Uh, yes. Yeah, the head of the EPA used his position to try and get his wife to be able to open one of those. So he was abusing his power and he got... Um, he got in trouble for that. He got in trouble for a lot of stuff that he did. Um, so just FYI, guys, the head of the EPA under uh, Trump had actually worked for oil companies in Oklahoma, and he had been sued by the EPA before he got appointed to run it. Okay, talk about Fox in charge of the hen house. Um, same with the energy company. It's supposed to, the Department of Energy is supposed to protect us and try to find green energy sources. And Ryan Zilke was appointed, who has spent his whole career working with energy companies. And so, of course, he used this position to trash all the laws or not to apply them. And then he changed one law, or one of those guys, changed a law 
to benefit a certain company. And he stepped down from that job and went to work for that company. But this is all okay, according to the political party that associates itself with Christianity, because our founding fathers did not have environmental laws, right? Well, we didn't have environmental problems either. Um, so I guess that annoys me when protecting the environment is considered anti-Christian, right? Uh, it's God's creation, you know? And the idea that you can ignore the way we're destroying it in the name of faith. I have trouble with that. Um, Michael, what about you? Um, so the, I guess the first thing that kind of came to my mind uh, had to do with like this, this the, the new ruling on abortion that seems to be pretty steep in, in religion, but more so in like uh, in, in Christianity. Uh, and kind of ignores other religions that uh, that like uh, I don't know. I've seen some stuff how like, like there are certain other religions that like uh, I'm not gonna say like need abortion, but like it, it is like a it is a part of their religion. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, and obviously like no one will ever say that the 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 court decision was based on on religion, um, but like uh, you definitely know that it plays a part. Um, but why, why is this religion the correct one versus another, if, if you will? Okay, because our founders weren't Christian, <laughs> but they were, not you know, a lot of them were religious heretics and Unitarians and all sorts of stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, Ryan? Um, this is actually perfect that you called me next, because that's something that I've I was thinking that's actually perfect that you called me next because that was something that I wanted to talk about was just the idea of like abortion and how religion I suppose plays a role in government and I just feel like even though I choose to live my path to uh, you know to God and stuff like that I am totally pro-choice like totally believe that there should be a separation between the government and our laws and religion. Because like you said earlier, it's how do you prioritize one religion over another? And I know this is like a crazy like dramatic difference, but like for example, Satanism. Like I did um Satanism, I did like a paper about it. And like if you go through their website and what their core values are, like I I mean I read through it and obviously I'm not a Satanist, but you look through it and it's like women empowerment, you know, choose your own destiny, um, have protection over your own rights, uh, question things, like things like that. Those are things I can resonate with, even though I'm not a Satanist. But I mean, how do you prioritize Christianity over Satanism, right? Because if they believe that you should have access to your, you know, healthcare and have um, the choice over what you do with your body, that's a religion. And they're formally known as a religion because there was, um, I don't know if it was in like Missouri. I'm not sure. There was like this time where um, the, I think it was like a Jesus statue, like a statue of Jesus was placed on state ground and they um, protested and said that they should have their, uh, back, I don't know, it's like the, the goat symbol. They were supposed to, they said that, uh, why would their statue be able to be on state grounds if you guys are supposed to be impartial? And so, um, you know, that that's something that interests me. I had a student who was a Satanist too, and he explained it to me, but if a Buddhist can vote, right? If they are citizens, then, you know, you have to, you can't just say, well, our founders were Christian because if you've let people vote who are these other religions, we have to have laws that account for all the religions, right? Um, anyway, okay, Tim. Um, me, I, well, I was, it, since two people, I think, or one person said something about abortion, I was like, well, I gotta have to change it. So, um, I was thinking probably like gun laws, like being able to carry and stuff like that, because some places shouldn't be allowed, but other places you can, but me personally, I think 
if he's using it for protection purposes only, I don't think it should be a problem. But that's just how I thought because some people do take advantage of it. So that's just unfortunate. But, I mean, it's just for protection, then I don't see a problem with it. I think everybody buys a gun for protection. It just yeah. doesn't always get used that way. I don't think too many people buy them because I'm going to go shoot somebody. Um, they commit suicide. I don't think they were planning to commit suicide when they bought the gun. Um, or it's a crime of passion. You know, they don't think their spouse or their partner is going to cheat on them. And, and they don't necessarily know how mad they're going to get about it. Um, but anyway... That's just, again, the Democrats will just talk about public safety and that's all. Just the statistically, if you have these certain regulations, you have fewer deaths. It's not, you know, that's all. It's nothing more complicated than that, I think. Um, so Zane, what do you think? Uh, kind of going actually more into that, like when it comes to like carrying, I would say like, like the idea of like, teachers should be able to like carry guns into school and stuff like that when it comes because of like the school shootings and stuff like that obviously there's uh sides that you know that think you know that would be necessary for protection you know of the students and stuff like that and also you know there's a side that says you know i don't see how that salt you know bringing you know more guns into the scenario i don't see how that you know is creating a solution and stuff like that so that's obviously a big uh debate so yeah i mean there are I mean, one time there was a police officer with a gun in the, you know, security. He left it in the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, there are all these crazy things that happen, right? A kid could, if the teacher has to wear the gun so that if they don't put it in their, in their desk drawer and some kid gets it, right? I mean, there's lots of things that can go wrong. But anyway, I mean, you could do statistically what's likely to preserve life right um something like that there probably should be some data before you um make a decision uh tim if i want to comment off what zane said i feel like that would kind of be effective because there was a shooting in texas with, um some kid going to elementary school and killed a lot of um people i feel like if some of those teachers had a gun probably would have made less people die or maybe none, especially if you walk into a school and you're older than everybody with a assault rifle, then kind of common sense, list, uh, except for like calling the cops and stuff, I already have it on you, like threatening them to leave, stuff like that, but that's just me. Is that the one where it took 45 minutes? Yes. Okay. Then I guess um, they, they were going more into investigation. He already killed his grandmother before and he was texting the girl and she didn't know he was for real. So it's like, it could have been avoided so many ways, but unfortunately it didn't get avoided. Yeah, okay. I mean, it is being investigated. There were a lot of people, grownups with guns that just didn't go into the building or whatever. It's kind of crazy, but anyway, Alisa, Alicia, go ahead. Um, Mine's kind of, weird I guess too but I was thinking of like the Girl Scouts of America and stuff because like I grew up a Girl Scout and um like they're a secular organization but there definitely are like Christian undertones like I remember my meetings were in like a Lutheran church or something and I know they recently got into like controversy in the last couple of years because they donate to Planned Parenthood oh. and um people were upset saying they're supporting abortions like christians were upset about it and it's like they're not looking at the big picture like um a small portion of what planned parenthood does is abortions majority of it is like mammograms std testing stuff like that and so you know they're just looking at it with like they're not looking at like a big picture of it and instead like their harm it harms more girls to not support like the Girl Scouts and Planned Parenthood than it is to. Um... Well, Sorry, it's, kinda... it's just a fact that Planned Parenthood does more to prevent abortions 
than any other organization because it hands out contraception and it does sex ed. I mean, that's just a fact. And that's where, again, I think it gets used for political purposes and also where religion gets brought in. But, you know, you could think whatever you want, but as a matter of fact, Planned Parenthood prevents more abortions because they go into poor neighborhoods and they hand out contraception. And those are the women that if they got pregnant, they get abortions, even if it were illegal, they're gonna go underground. They're not, anyway. So that that's an issue, but um, okay. So next time we're gonna do um, the apology. This is Socrates uh, defending his way of life. And then was Socrates guilty of corrupting the youth? All that wonderful stuff. And, uh, uh, sorry, I've got the wrong dates. I mean, that doesn't matter, June 30th. And we're gonna have to do Crito also. So please read uh, both of those documents and we will meet and um, try to answer, either answer the questions or come with a thing that you would want to talk about. Oh, this is July 1st. Okay, I guess we're okay. So Plato's apology, go for it. Is Socrates guilty or not? And I really want you to think about how many, do you know people who think that Socrates is a guilty and he's corrupting the youth and he doesn't believe in the city's gods? And I mean, you might think, but he doesn't deserve to die for it, right? But he is one of those liberals who is, was the reason why our country got uh, hit by 9-11 because it was being given over to the liberals. So, um, so try to think about, you know, if you can identify with Socrates or if you are not, what you think a democracy, right? What is a good citizen? So I'm gonna give my little video, right, for tomorrow. And I'll just be Socrates sort of thinking about life <laughs> and how it works. Cause it is complicated. It's not, um, it's not clear cut. It's not simple. Um, the way things are polarized now, Socrates, just FYI, he was hated by the conservatives and the liberals. They both hated him. He told the liberals they should stop being so self-indulgent get their sex lives together, stuff like that. And he, and he told the conservatives, they have to allow for freedom of thought. And so hopefully you'll see analogies and come up with your own examples. All right, take care. And I will be here if anybody has any more questions. Yes, um, just to clarify, so when we turn in stuff, it's not daily, it's at the end of the week. Yep. And then at the end of the week, it's, it's uh, have dates on the document every day about, um, about three questions of what you read. Yeah, or, you know, you could answer the questions I have on the stream. Just 75 words approximately that you wrote before you came to class. And then about 75 words after class. I think I've written that down in a couple places in case. Okay, I think I have it written down on the post itself and also on the syllabus. Okay. But I can check that and I can remind you. Um, right, and then. When it comes, okay, after you do that for the week, I'm still stuck on the part where you said it's gonna um, add on to your